Hey partners, it's me, that's how you want guy here again, and at long last, the wait is finally over. Today we're taking a look at one of the best sequel films of all time, and quite possibly the best animated sequel film of all time, Toy Story 2. Now Sakoa is back with me again for this review guys. You sure there's no contract here? Ugh, script again. Damn it. Damn it! Come on man, it's not that bad. You like the first movie, right? I promise these films will be like a walk in the park for us. Yeah, well, that's true. But to be honest, I had a lot of fun reviewing the first film with you, so... I'm actually kind of excited to see what all the other three Toy Story films have in store, so... You know what, let's go ahead and start the second film right away. Alright then, well this time you can start the review for a change. When you make a new movie or franchise, you're basically rolling the dice on how that franchise would end up. You could make some profit enough to pay back your finished product, or it could bomb if you just wasted all the money on the movie that failed. Luckily for Pixar and Lasseter, Toy Story not only succeeded, but if you saw the last review, you know how well it did when it first came out. Great reviews, amazing box office results, and the merch. Tons and tons of merch. Video games, actual toys of the characters, it was huge. So it's a no-brainer that a talk of the sequel to the movie was already happening. Literally after the first opening in a month, Lasseter saw how his characters like Woody impacted the lives of children, as he saw one boy showing his father a Woody doll and realized that he and his team had to do something to the first Toy Story movie. Lucky for the team, Disney was more than willing to let the team make a sequel to Toy Story, and it just so happened that around Toy Story's release date, Disney has just started doing direct video sequels with their popular movies, starting with Aladdin in The Return of Javar in 1994, and they felt that Toy Story would be a good choice to go along with the sequels. The only thing the team had to consider was, one, what kind of animation would the sequel have? Because direct video was more low budget than a theatrical movie, so they had to make a choice if it should be CGI like the first film, or be hand drawn. The other thing was, what kind of story would the second film have? And that's where they ran into another problem. Disney liked the story so much that they felt that a directed video wasn't going to do the film justice. So they move it as a theatrical film after all. So now the team had to rewrite the story and find new animators and workers to make the film, as the top team in Pixar was already working on their second animated film, A Bug's Life. But nevertheless, the team felt that they had made the story better and gave Toy Story a second round in the movie theaters. After the release of the movie, talks of a sequel began to surface as far back as December of 1995. Shortly after the release of Toy Story, Pixar CEO Ed Campbell, director John Lasseter and producer Ralph Guggenheim visited then new Disney CEO Joe Roth who was pleased at the idea of a sequel to Toy Story and soon gave the approval for the sequel to begin production. When production started, there were a few obstacles the team encountered. Questions arose as to whether the film should be computer animated by Pixar or traditionally cell animated by the Walt Disney Studios and whether Tom Hanks, Tim Allen and the rest of the cast of the previous film would be available and affordable to reprise their roles. With this movie being an opportunity for new directing talent, Lasseter approached a young animator by the name of Ash Brennan to direct the movie, whose work he admired. With the sequel in production, Toy Story 2 was officially announced by Disney and Pixar on a press release on March 12, 1997. The story of Toy Story 2 was inspired by Lasseter himself, who is a toy collector. The story originated with him wondering what a toy will find upsetting, how a toy will feel if it were not played with by a child, or worse, a child growing out of a toy. Then director Ash Brannon suggested the idea of a yard sale where the collector recognizes Woody as a rare artifact. This concept was recycled from the never made television special A Tin Toy Christmas. The movie's first antagonist, Al Wiggenheim, who originally appeared in the earliest drafts of the original Toy Story, was inserted into this film and he was inspired by none other than Lasseter himself. The character of Jesse was kindled by Lasseter's wife Nancy Lasseter who pressed him that the movie needed a strong female character as opposed to the soft and chill Bo Peep. 
With the story of the film entering production stage in early 1997, it was still unclear whether the film would be animated by Pixar, as the team of 300 employees were busy working on A Bug's Life, which was scheduled to be released in late 1998. But then Apple co-founder and Pixar shareholder Steve Jobs had an idea. He decided to shut down production on the computer games the Interactive Products Group had been making for the original Toy Story. After they released two successful CD-ROMs the previous year on the very tight deadlines, those being Disney's animated storybook Toy Story and the Toy Story Activity Center, and he moved the staff at the Interactive Products Group to work on Toy Story 2. The Toy Story 2 crew had been on its own, placed in a new building that was well separated from the rest of the company by railroad tracks, to start working on the director video sequel. The film reused digital elements from Toy Story, but True to the company's prevailing culture of perfectionism, it reused less digital images from the previous film. The character models received major upgrades eternally and shaders went through revisions to bring about subtle improvements. The team freely borrowed models from other productions, such as Gurry from Pixar's 1997 short Gurry's Game, who became the cleaner in Toy Story 2. The production of the movie was off to a slow start, and in June of 1997, Disney became unhappy with the slow pace of work, and demanded that Toy Story producer Ralphin Guggenheim was replaced. Pixar agreed, and they let him go. As a result of Guggenheim's firing, Karen Jackson and Helen Ploinkin, who were originally associate producers, moved up into the roles of co-producers. Eisner came on board to direct the film after finishing work on A Bug's Life, while Lee Uncridge stepped in as another co-director, though he would focus on the layout and cinematography of the film, while Ash Barron would be credited as co-director. In November, Pixar invited Disney executives Joe Roth and Peter Snyder to view some story reels of the film with finished animation. They were so impressed at the story and the quality of work put into the film that they decided to upgrade the film's status from being direct-to-video sequel to a theatrical film. Pixar initially became shocked at the unexpected turn of events, but there were other reasons as to why the move from direct-to-video to theatrical release made the film more compelling. The most understandable reason for this change was the economics of a direct-to-video Pixar release were not working as well as hope thanks to the higher salaries of the crew. After some negotiations, Jobs and Roth agreed that the split of costs and profits for Toy Story 2 would fall on the model of a newly created five-film deal. But Toy Story 2 would not count as one of the five films on Pixar's contract with Disney. Jobs then announced to the crew the change in plans for the film on February 5, 1998. However, no one was prepared for an incident that would change the movie's production history forever. One day in December of 1998, less than a year before the film's release, an unidentified animator was doing cleanups to the Pixar computer when all of a sudden the un unidentified animator accidentally started the deletion of a root folder containing the files needed to animate the movie. Associate Technical Director Oren Jacob was the first one to notice as the character models disappeared from their works in progress and quickly shut down the file servers but sadly the crews had lost 90% of the work done on the movie. And the backups that they had for the movie didn't work as they later found out that they had failed some time previously. Then a miracle happened when technical director Galen Sussman, who had been working from her home to take care of her newborn child, Eli, revealed she had backups of the assets on her home computer. The Pixar team was able to recover nearly all the lost assets, save for a few recent days of work, allowing the film to continue production as normal. As production advanced, however, many creative staff at Pixar were not happy on how the sequel was turning out. And when Lasseter returned from Europe after promoting A Bug's Life, he watched some of the story reels of the movie and agreed that the sequel wasn't working. So Pixar met with Disney hoping that they could change the release of the film after they told them the bad news that they would have to redo the entire film. However, Disney disagreed with the decision and told Pixar that they didn't have time to remake the entire film, as the release date was just a few months away and could not be moved. So Pixar decided that they simply could not allow the film to be released in its existing state, and asked Lasseter to take over production. Lasseter agreed, and recruited the first film's creative team to redevelop the story. To meet Disney's deadline, Pixar had to compile the entire film in just 9 months. Lasseter and the story team redeveloped the entire plot of the movie in just one weekend. At his home, Lasseter hosted what he called a story summit, a crash exercise that would yield a finished story in just 2 days. 
Co-director Lee Unkrich was very concerned with the small amount of time Pixar had to make the film before its November 1999 deadline. He called Steve Jobs to ask him if the release date could be moved, but Jobs told him there was no choice and that the film would have to be ready in just 9 months, as we stated before. Brandon focused on the development, story, and animation. Lazar was in charge of art, modeling, and lightning, and Unkrich oversaw editorial and layout. Since they met daily to discuss progress with each other, they wanted to ensure they were all progressing in the same direction. The boundaries of their responsibility overlapped. As the release date got closer and closer, many Pixar employees and animators overworked themselves to the point where some of them ended up getting carpal tunnel syndrome and repetitive strain injuries due to working for hours on the animation. Fortunately though, Pixar became very concerned with the health and safety of its employees and they set limits as to how many hours each animator and employee could work, and whether or not he or she could work overtime. The overtime hours resulted in numerous incidents with some Pixar employees. In one instance, an animator had forgotten to drop his child off at daycare one morning, and, in a mental haste, forgot the baby in the back seat of his car in the parking lot. Fortunately though, some workers were able to rescue the baby, but it became an example that the team were working too hard. Pixar CEO Ed Kamuel will later disclose that a full third of the staff ended up with some form of RSI by the time the film was finished. And so, after nine months of trouble production and hard work, the film was finally finished and just a few weeks before its official debut. Pixar did a screening of the finished film at Color Arts on November 12th, 1999. The next day, the film had its official premiere at El Captain Theater and was later re-released across the United States on November 24, 1999, and just a month later, on Christmas Day 1999, a blooper reel was added to the movie during the credits. Okay, so we know how the first Toy Story film worked out for critics and audience, and how Toy Bonnie and I felt about this movie 25 years later. Now, making a sequel is like throwing darts at a board with your eyes closed. It could work and you'd have a successful franchise at your hands. Or it could bomb and the franchise could end on a bad low note. Now, spoilers, but Toy Story 2 actually did more than just succeed in theaters. But more on that later. So again, after all these years, does this movie still hold up? Well, for the most part, yes. I think this film holds up as a standalone film and a sequel to the first Toy Story. It does something that a sequel should do, show characters growing up and how much they develop from the first movie. From this movie, we see the characters slowly changing and growing from the last film, from Andy being concerned for Woody after he accidentally ripped his right arm, to even Woody thinking about what's going to happen to him and the other toys once he grows up and doesn't need them anymore. You see his concern, and I like that they play off more on how a toy feels when someone that has taken care of them for a long time might not need them anymore because they've grown up this time. Again, it's something anyone can understand his worries, and they do a great job of showing it without telling too much. Basically, the measures is a good and simple one in that, yeah, it's going to suck to see your child or the ones you love growing up and knowing they won't be around for long, but that doesn't mean you could just give up. You can still make as many happy memories with them until that day comes. And even then, it doesn't mean that your child won't want to see you ever again. There's some that will still make time for you. But for others like Jesse, and sadly it also happens in real life, there are others that just end up forgetting you entirely. Like they just stop playing or don't see you as anything else. And it could be pretty hard for someone going through that kind of pain. Speaking of which, I like Jesse. I can see how she might have gotten on some people's nerves when she first appears, but you start to understand why she's hostile towards Annie due to her own experience, and she does bring up a good point on why she doesn't want to be with anyone else, or why she doesn't want to go through the same pain again. There's a couple of good moments in this movie, and this is definitely a step up from the last film. Keyword? For the most part. Much like the last Toy Story, while the animation is a step up for the toys and some human characters, Annie still looks off to me, and once again, outside of the song for Jesse's backstory, the songs are once again bland and not memorable. Seriously Disney, there's a reason why Pixar never wanted songs for Toy Story in the first place. Outside of that, I felt the side story was weird. I mean, it had its good moments and even some funny dialogue between Utility Belt Buzz Lightyear and Zerg, but I remember saying, what did this have to do with anything? 
It felt like the writers were just like, shit, we need to fill the runtime somehow, and they made the side story at the last minute. It's one of those where if you were to take it out, nothing would change. That and there's the issue with the villain. Here's a fun fact. Originally, Jessie was going to be the villain in this movie, and honestly, I wished it was her or Al as the villain for this movie. I don't get why Pickaxe Pete has to be the villain, or better yet, why do we need a villain in this Toy Story movie? His motivation makes no sense. Come on, just because you've never been sold or been played with by any child doesn't mean that it sucks or that life would be better if you would have stayed in the box. You'd be placed in a giant glass case. What the hell are you even going to do in Japan? Jesse has more of a motivation for going to Japan. We don't even know Pete that much for him to be a villain. Anyway, before I get my final thoughts, let's see what Toy Bonnie thinks about this movie. Toy Story 2 for me is a great example of how a sequel should be made. I like that this movie gave us something different to focus on rather than a rehash of the first movie, which is a problem most sequel films have these days. The story for the movie is a very good one. I like how it explored the idea of how a toy could feel once they discover that they're a collectible, and when Woody finds out that he's a collectible, that's when the movie really starts to get good. The returning characters were all really good, and I'm pretty glad that they got rid of Jerky Ham and Mr. Potato Head in this movie. As for the new characters, they're all really good. If I had to pick my favorite of the new characters, I would go for Wheezy. The sets for the movie are all amazing. I love how the city looks when Buzz and the toys are crossing the road, and plus the shading effects are very good compared to the first movie. Some of my favorite scenes from the movie are Buzz and the toys crossing the road, Woody checking out the Woody's Roundup collection, I'll complain that he has to drive all the way to work on a Saturday, which by the way has become an internet meme these days. Jesse's backstory, and Wheezy singing You Got a Friend in Me at the very end of the movie. As for the songs, I like only two of the songs in this movie. When She Loved Me is such a beautiful heartwarming song that really suits Jesse's backstory. Sarah McClone did an amazing job on this song, and her vocals really capture the emotion of the song. Another song I really love is Robert Goulet's version of You Got a Friend in Me. It's so upbeat and fun to listen to, and to be completely honest, I take Robert's version over the original one big time. The only song I can find eh is Woody's Roundup. It's not a terrible song by any means, but to me it's just meh. Now even though the movie still holds up as one of the most critically acclaimed animated films of all time, the animation looks dated by today's standards. Now considering that this movie came out 4 years after the first movie, the human models were given extensive upgrades and they all look really good, and it shows that the team really worked hard to make the models look good. The shading effects, while better here than in the first movie, they look severely outdated in today's standards. I'm sure it was mind blowing back then, but now it kinda looks like if they did 50% shading and they didn't even bother to fix them once they completed the scene. Another thing that I have some gripes with is that Stinky Pete is kind of a weak villain to me. Like Sakoa said, Al should have been the plain villain of this movie, or hey, maybe Jesse could have gotten a chance to be the villain. But Stinky Pete is a villain? Really? I also understand that Jessie can get on people's nerves quite quickly, and I really did mind her at first because her over excitement got on my nerves pretty quickly, but once you learn that she suffers from claustrophobia because her former owner Emily abandoned her, you start to feel sorry for her and you wish she has a happy life when she accompanies Woody to Andy's house. Overall, was this movie a step up from the first one? Yes. There were plenty of good upgrades from the animation, and I liked the continuation with the relationship between the toys and the humans, and knowing that they will grow up someday. The new characters, outside of Pete, were good characters and had a couple of funny moments. While it still has its faults, I think the team did a good job making the sequel, and I can see why many love this movie. As for me, I'm confident to give this movie and its sequel a 7 out of 10 for a good movie. Toy Story 2 for me is both a great film and a great sequel to the original Toy Story. I can understand why critics consider this to be one of the very few sequel films superior to the original film. The story is amazing and it's a huge step up from the last film, so I'm gonna call this a very very good movie. When Toy Story 2 came out, it did something sequels rarely do on the first go be successful. And I don't just mean it did good or decent, I mean it did really good on the first night. Critics that loved the first Toy Story fell in love with the sequel as much as the first movie, with critics noting that the reason the sequel did well was the fact that it wasn't just a remake of the first film, it developed the characters we already had and gave them more depth. As of right now, 
The movie still has a fresh 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, 88 out of 100 on Metacritic, and an A-plus on Cinema Scores. The film was so well liked that the late famous animator Chuck Jones wrote a letter to Lassiter calling it a wonderful and beautifully animated, and he praised him for advancing the classic animation in a new and effective way. Lassiter was so touched that he framed the letter in his house. At the box office, it was ranked as the highest grossing movie in 1999, earning $245.9 million in North America and $497.4 million worldwide. And to this day, Toy Story 2 is the third highest grossing movie of all time, ranked behind Aladdin and The Lion King. The movie received several recognitions, including seven Annie Awards. Other awards the film won were the Blockbuster Entertainment Award for Favorite Family Film, the Critics' Choice Award for Best Animated Film, the Bogey Award, and a Golden Globe Award for Best Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. The song When She Loved Me won Randy Newman a Grammy Award for Best Song Written for a Motion Picture, Television, or Other Visual Media. In addition to that, a Satellite Award was given for Outstanding Youth DVD and a Golden Satellite Award for Best Motion Picture, Animated, or Mixed Media, and one for Best Original Song, When She Loved Me. Now in terms of home video releases, the film was first released on VHS on October 17, 2000. Like its predecessor, the DVD version was first released as part of the Ultimate Toy Bots box set on October 17, 2000. And also like its predecessor, the DVD was later sold individually starting from March 20, 2001. This and the first Toy Story film were later included in a 3 DVD pack along with A Bucks Life. On December 26, 2005, the film was reissued on DVD as a 2 disc special edition DVD. And side note to home media collectors, this is the last version of the movie to have the credits without the outtakes. The film was later issued on a Blu-ray slash DVD combo pack on March 23, 2010 to coincide with the release of Toy Story 3. It was later reissued on Blu-ray various times, first on November 1, 2011, and later on November 29, 2015, and finally on May 26, 2019. Lastly, the most recent release of the movie on home media was on June 4th, 2019 when it was issued as a 4K Blu-ray disc to coincide with the release of Toy Story 4. Alright, well we got two Toy Story movies done and only two more to go. So far the first two Toy Story films were successful and we can see why. Up next is Toy Story 3, a movie that has also performed well. So we'll see you guys at- Oh no, there's no freaking way I'm doing that movie. What? Why not? Because there is no Toy Story 3. That movie doesn't exist. Uh, what? There's no such thing as a movie where the toys go to a fucking daycare and they decide like, fuck Andy or Woody, we're staying here. Ugh. Do I sense the type of hate you have right now? Yes, it's called Toy Story 3 Sucks and Fuck That Movie. Uh, hey, hey, you promised the fans that you would review every Toy Story movie for the 25th anniversary, and that includes this movie too. Yes, I did say that, but fuck that movie! I ain't doing that bullshit third movie! Hey, hey, come on now. Is it really the worst movie you've seen? Toy Story 3. Really? Is it really that bad that you're making it out to be? Yes, it's possibly one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Thank god that wasn't the last movie of the bunch, because if it was, oh boy. I will rant on how much Toy Story 3 is a bad movie to end the franchise. Okay, now you're just really being overdramatic. Look. If I can sit through bad episodes of Thomas or any other shows that I like, you can sit through a bad movie. In fact, I bet once we've seen this movie, you might change your mind about it. And with me, it really shouldn't be all that bad. Ugh, fine, fine. You win this time, just don't make me force you to replay the original Lost Levels 8 times with Luigi as punishment for making me review Toy Story 3. <sighs> like I haven't played hard and tortured games enough already on my gaming channel. Anyway, that's settled then. We'll see you guys next time with Toy Story 3. Hey guys, thanks for watching our review on the second Toy Story film. Now there is one thing I forgot to mention during our review of Toy Story 2, and that is that while I was writing the script for the review, I found the original script for the direct video Toy Story 2. The script is 77 pages long, and after reading it for myself, I'm very impressed that the original director video Toy Story 2 was drastically different from the movie we got in the end. If you want to read this script for yourself, I'll leave a link to the script in the description below. I'd love to see what you guys think. Well, that's about it guys, we'll see you guys in our review of Toy Story 3. Peace out my boys.